All right, we are now recording, so I'll put this on. Hi, everyone. Hello. Uh, we're Hi. coming to you from uh, the University of Mount Olive in Mount Olive, North Carolina, and the Tillman School of Business at that university. Uh, where uh, a team of MBA students is just completing their MBA curriculum uh, by uh, conducting this strategic evaluation of the Toyota company. And that's what uh, this video is about, the Toyota and uh, its uh, strategic situation as this team sees it. And with that, I'm going to turn the meeting over to Brooke Tesner, who will introduce herself uh, and her teammates. So Brooke, it's all yours. Okay, thank you very much, Professor. Um, as the Professor stated, my name is Brooke Tesner. I am the Director of Financial Operations for a factoring company. Um, we've had a really great team for this project. Um, I'll start introducing them. First, I'll start with uh, Fernando. And then we have Lisa and Amanda. Okay. Uh, would you care to start the presentation? Uh, did y'all want to introduce yourselves? In oh, that's a good or? idea. Yeah, yeah. Let them introduce themselves. Okay. Uh, Fernando. Sure, I'll go ahead. Okay. Fernando? Um, yeah, I'm Fernando Rosco. I'm here in uh, Rougemont, North Carolina. I work at Duke University with the uh, as an assistant operations manager for the Department of um, School of Medicine. So, okay. okay. Who's next? Lisa, you want to go next, Lisa? Sure. Uh, my name is Lisa Moran. I'm a Jacksonville native. I'm currently employed with the Department of Defense as a 911 dispatcher, and I've been doing it for about 16, 17 years. Okay. And Amanda? Amanda, your microphone's not on. We don't hear you. Do you hear Amanda? I do not. I can, I can see her, but I cannot hear yeah. her. Amanda, you might want to log back in again. We cannot hear a thing you're saying. And while we're doing that, I will be accosted by this dog. <laughs> <laughs> We were hoping he would show up during the video. Yep. He's, <laughs> he's early tonight. <laughs> and uh, he's <laughs> here for one reason. That is to hold me up for the ransom. <laughs> Let's see. Here's Amanda. We'll hope that Amanda comes back on successfully. Hello, Amanda. Hi, everyone. Can you hear me now? Yes, yes. we can. Yes. Yeah. Technical glitches already. Great. <laughs> okay. um, I live in Clayton, North Carolina, which is right outside of Raleigh, and I'm a senior accountant for a large civil construction company. Okay. Now we can start this program. So, And again, uh, Brooke, if you would just uh, start us off or introduce us to whoever is going to begin. Yeah, um, so if you want to go ahead and go to the second slide, I'll give us um, an overview of the introduction and background, and then Lisa's going to start for us. Okay. Okay. So um, during this section, we'll be covering the history, the products, mission, uh, Abel's model, and then the vision of Toyota. Uh, you can, yep, and you can go ahead and go to slide four, and that's where Lisa will start. Okay, so the Toyota Motor Corporation was founded by Kiichiro Toyota. He was born in Japan on June 11, 1894. His father, Sakichi Toyota, founded Toyota Loom Works, and Kiichi worked for his father's company, um, but he also planned to develop an automobile. He was able to establish an auto division within his father's company, the Loom Works, in 1933. Uh, Toyota completes the A-type 
automobile engine in 1934, which is featured to the bottom, the picture on the bottom. And a year later, the auto division released the prototype of model A1 passenger vehicle. Uh, the first vehicle being the model G1, which was a truck that was built. In 1936, uh, they start the production for the model AA. And in 1937, they changed the name from Toyota to Toyota because it is considered a luckier name and easier to write in Japanese. Oh. Um, it, it only takes about eight brush strokes when you write in kanji. And in Japan, since the olden days, people have always thought that the number eight was lucky and meant that things would go well in the future. And Kiichiro definitely wanted to bring prosperity to his company as well as his country. Um, the Toyota Motor Corporation was formed as a spinoff of his father's company, uh, the Loom Works. And the first vehicle, the AA, which is a, the picture to the left, was a blatant copy of the Chevrolet Airflow. Uh, the engine was based on a Chevrolet design, the chassis was copied from Ford, and the styling was derived from a Chrysler Airflow, like I mentioned before. Um, after completion, Kichiro drove one of the prototypes to his father's grave as a sign of respect. And then in 1938, the Just-In-Time system was launched. The Just-In-Time inventory system is a management strategy that minimizes inventory and increases efficiency. Um, Just-In-Time is also known as the Toyota Production System, or TPS. It is considered a pull approach in manufacturing. And when sales activities warrant more production, inventory is actually pooled and more manufacturing supplies are ordered, which result in a smooth flow of production and reduced inventory costs. Um, in the 1950s, Toyota's executives became inspired to create the Toyota pr production system, which was also based off ideas taken from the Ford Motor Company. And in 1966, Toyota introduced its compact Corolla model. Okay, now be careful when you've got slides full of text. Don't feel that you have to read every word on that slide because the audience can also read it. Just okay. give us the idea of the principal points and let the folks read the slide later on. Yes, sir. Here's a good example. All right, so Kaizen and Kanban are terms that are rooted in Japanese business and manufacturing. Both were coined by the Japanese who were trying to find an ideal way of developing their growth. Um, both are pillars of the Toyota way. Kaizen is a philosophy where Kai means uh, change, Zen means good, and it's a Japanese term that means change for the better or continuous improvement. It was created by Masaaki Imai in 1986. The Kanban process, um, means billboard or sign, and it was created by Taiichi Ono, who was also an industrial engineer and businessman for Toyota in the 1940s. So, Kaizen is a means for continuous improvement, uh, and Kanban is a method of controlling inventory uh, that is, among other things, uh, uh, the basis for just-in-time processes, for instance. And these two techniques uh, enabled Japanese auto manufacturers, particularly Toyota, uh, to make some significant gains on American manufacturers. So this slide actually shows a snapshot of the history of Toyota as it relates to relevant world events. So we can see that Toyota has survived um, some major events such as World War II, the 1980 US-Japan trade fiction, um, and then the 2006 financial crisis. And even though Toyota had to go through these things, uh, they still were able to emerge as um, this advanced global corporation who eventually became the number one automobile manufacturer. Okay. I'm going to introduce <clears throat> uh, the Chinese and Japanese uh, conflict, which in, it might seem a little random now, but we'll go into detail why this is important, not only for the cultures, but also for Toyota itself and trying to be able to establish a good market. 
in China. So it all started in 1937 with the second Sino-Japanese War, where the Japanese Imperial forces had invaded the town of Nanking, and which in that time was the capital. So that's that was important in itself. Uh, I do want to give a disclaimer. <laughs> Uh, for the faint-hearted, there is a lot of heinous war crimes committed during this time from by the Japanese for the Chinese citizens, where uh, women, children, a lot of people were violated, were also um, murdered and killed. So the Chinese estimate about 300,000 Chinese citizens died during that time, and that was a pretty big deal. Uh, so what this means long-term, the generational impact is vast. So you have the stories being handed down from one generation to the next about what happened. Um, there was many survivors, but this actually gave the Chinese a very, very poor view of Japanese and their culture. And just uh, even to this day, there's still views where um, I found a survey that in, in 2013, about 90% of the Chinese still have a disfavorable view of Japanese uh, people. Uh, luckily, things are changing and they're progressing. Uh, I do want to say that the, I read an article about the coronavirus in Japanese, uh, Jap Japan was able to send supplies over to China when they were struggling with the, the virus and a lot of medical supplies, things like that. So that was something that they're trying to mend and they're really working on it. So you'll see how important later all this has to do with Toyota being able to be successful. Okay, but at, at a minimum right now, what we can say is that historically yes. since uh, prior to the Second World War to current, uh, mm -hmm. there have been cultural tensions uh, between Japanese and Chinese and that uh, th these are not uh, issues of formal politics or law or anything. They're culture. They're based upon attitudes of Chinese about Japanese because of atrocities that were performed during the Second World War. Is that right? That's correct. Okay. So in addition to some of the history we've already talked about, uh, we also wanted to point out some important milestones related to Toyota. Um, so in 1957, Toyota Motor Sales um, USA Inc. was established. In 1962, uh, that's when the first overseas vehicle plant in Brazil was established. Um, in 1984, uh, Toyota's first U.S. car assembly plant, which was a joint venture with General Motors Corp. opens in California. That was referred to as NUMI which stands for the uh, new, new, new United Motor Manufacturing, Inc. And then in 1997, the Prius uh, was launched, which was the first mass-produced hybrid car. Uh, then in 2001, the Toyota Way was announced, uh, which included the just-in-time production. And then in 2006, uh, Toyota's group global sales um, exceeds GMs by 128,000. Uh, which made, made it the world's uh, biggest automaker. So um, this graphic was actually published by Toyota as a celebration of their history. And um, some of the important things that it points out is that Toyotas are sold in over 160 countries um, and that they have sold over 5.6 million hybrid vehicles worldwide. So the next section that we're going to get into um, is Toyota's products. The first one we're going to talk about is the WellCap series, which is a product that is specifically made for the disabled or um, elderly. The next is going to be um, the Lexus luxury line. Uh, you can see that there are several different um, types of models that they have. And the one pictured is actually the Lexus RX, which is one of the most uh, popular crossover vehicles. Uh, next we have the mini vehicles. Uh, both of the ones pictured are sold in Japan. You have the Pixis truck and then the Epoch, which is the silver one. Um, next we have vans, trucks, and buses. So you can see that Toyota produces a variety of different sizes. Um, the one in blue is the Quick Delivery 200. Yeah. 
And then these are their sport utility vehicles. Uh, we have the FJ Cruiser and then also the Land Cruiser. Um, so these are the hatchback models. This would be the Prius. Uh, I'm sorry, this is the Toyota mm -hmm. Aqua, which mm -hmm. is um, the most successful launched uh, vehicle since the Prius in Japan. Which model is it? This is the Aqua. Oh, the Aqua. Nice looking car. Yeah. Um, so these are their minivans and club wagons. Um, the orange one is going to be the Noah, and then the wagon is called the Toyota Succeed. And so the last product we have are the sedan and then the sport. You can see the sedan is going to be the one that they have the most of, and this is also uh, the most popular selling model. Um, this includes like the Corolla and the um, Camry and then the Prius. So the next section involves uh, Toyota's mission statement. So this is actually the mission that comes from their website. Um, it, their mission is to attract and attain customers with high value product services and the most satisfying ownership experience. And one thing that's important to point out about this mission is that it may seem a little idealistic, which um, as Fernando is gonna explain later, their vision also uh, kind of seems that way, but it's important to understand that from for the Japanese, their their word is very important. And so that their products being designed and that, you know, them wanting to make a difference, their customers, they truly feel that way. And it's it's um, integrated in them from a young age that that's a part of who they are and that their products need to mean something. Good point. Uh, I spent some time in Japan. Um, and... Uh, it's 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 quite remarkable, but uh, companies view themselves as not just uh, to uh, being in business to make a profit, such as an American company might, uh, but uh, the company actually does have a mission. It's got some some purpose uh, that lasts for a long time rather than a short time. And uh, uh, the folks in Japan, uh, they, they, they often repeat this mission, this idea of what the company is for. Um, and uh, uh, it goes way back to uh, the time when the Japanese had, uh, uh, I don't know what you'd call it, uh, uh, international missions with the Navy. Uh, to uh, to to take the empire out into the world because Japan's a relatively small uh, island nation, and so the uh, the the nation uh, of Japan had this this constant pursuit of influence elsewhere, and so and that pervaded into uh, corporate culture. And so today, Toyota has a mission of, uh, of being important uh, for a particular reason, in this case, worldwide. Uh, if we went to Honda uh, or Suzuki, uh, we'd, uh, we'd, we'd find some idea in each of those companies about uh, the importance that the company wants to have, uh, whether it really does or not is another issue, but it becomes part of the psychology of the people uh, who work in these companies. And it's, it's a real thing. It's very difficult to put your finger on or to point to specifically, uh, but this, this, the, this cultural um, foundation of Japanese companies is a, is a real thing. Uh, to understand Japanese business, you have to understand this cultural foundation. It's very difficult to do. I'm not sure I ever did. Um, so next we have Abel's model. And um, Abel's model is used to define which business the company is active in. Um, the first thing we start with is the market segment served. So for Toyota, um, we have those markets including the budget conscious, which um, Toyota has 
cars that are available for under $20,000. Uh, the environmentally aware, uh, Toyota produces the hybrid and alternative fuel source vehicles, uh, families, which would be SUVs and the vans, and then um, luxury, the Lexus brand, and also the segment of off-roaders. Uh, you can have vehicles like the FJ Cruiser model. Um, second, you have the unmet needs, which would include um, alternative fuel sources, affordable options in growing markets, autonomous vehicles, and then alternative vehicle design, which would include two or three wheeled vehicles. And then lastly, we have the distinctive competencies, which uh, would be innovation, research and development, a strong dealer network, and also their advanced manufacturing. Yeah, how do, does the company have the ability to meet those unmet needs? I'm going to go over the vision statement. And like uh, Brooke mentioned earlier, they're really idealistic, very positive, but also has meaning with their strong historical like culture and how they want their businesses run. Um, I'm just going to point out a few of the main things in their vision statement. Uh, so. Off the bat, they just want to lead in future mobility, uh, enriching lives. Uh, they want to be the most in the safest, responsible way of moving people. So, I mean, that's really, again, it's not saying what they're doing, more just what they see themselves doing. Uh, through the commitment of quality. Oh, oh I'm sorry. That's no, right. I, was, I have a couple more points. Uh, I was going to discuss the awesome little diagram, too. Uh, that, that's just one of the points. And also, towards the bottom, of the roots, looking at the diagram, the five main, five main principles, and I looked up, it's really just being it's the culture of how they raise people. So they're studious, they're creative, uh, they want their lives to be more home-like, uh, very friendly, hospitality kind of, this is our culture, and that's the, the roots of how they want to see their visions. And now going upwards, you have the better cars, enriching this whole idealistic thing. Uh, I know you mentioned earlier with the whole um, making it like a propaganda or uh, very idealistic, and that's what we're kind of driving home with this slide. So the next section we're going to focus on is the environmental assessment. This will include the economics, the market served by Toyota, and then also the industry structure. Good. The data for the environmental analysis was pulled from the International Monetary Fund and when assessing the environmental indicators it is important to see how they relate to one another. Uh, we're going to be going over the GDP, PPP, inflation, population, unemployment, and national savings. Okay. Uh, this right here is just a graphic of the countries by the GDP, PPP per capita pulled from the IMF. Uh, the GDP PPP is the purchasing power parity. And while the GDP represents all goods in terms of market value produced by a nation, the PPP is an economic theory that compares the different countries' currencies through a basket of goods approach. Um, and comparing the GDP without taking into account the purchasing power parity, uh, you'll not get an accurate representation of the purchasing power in the country. You need to take into account what a dollar in each country can buy. Right. We've got some feedback somewhere. I don't think it's on my end, but uh, if there's any background noise where you're sitting, please mute, mute your microphone. Okay. So uh, the, the countries in darker colors are those with the larger economies, if I've understood your map correctly. Yes, sir. Okay. Well, maybe somebody wants to look at that. Uh, looks like it's the U.S., it's uh, portions of Western Europe, most of Western Europe. Um, looks like uh, uh, in the Mideast um, and uh, perhaps Australia, also Japan. This is an overview of the GDP uh, purchasing power parity for all of the eight markets that we will be conducting an environment, environmental analysis of. Uh, the importance of using the purchasing power parity is because it takes into account the relative cost of local goods, services, and inflation rates. Um, an example of this is if you were to buy a gallon of orange juice in Japan and it costs $6 and $2 in the US, 
then one gallon of orange juice can be bought in Japan versus three in America, uh, making the PPP index for Japan versus the US a uh, one to three. So if you had the same amount of money, you would be able to buy more orange juice in this example in America. In, uh, in my case, uh, coffee. You remember. I know. I didn't want, I couldn't use your exact example. I had to change it a little bit. Oh, well, that was a good example. You're absolutely right. For those of you in cyberspace, um, the professor is a caffeine addict. And uh, when I got to Japan, uh, the, the first thing I needed was more coffee. And I found out that I was going to spend a lot more for coffee there than what I was used to. Okay. So this is the purchasing power for the larger markets. And a few things to know is that China is uh, the largest economy and India's uh, purchasing power is rapidly increasing. However, the people of India do not have consumption power. Um, and by 2040, they will catch up to China in regards to their purchasing power. Yeah. One of the things that uh, uh, I was looking at this diagram, hoping that I could do the translation for you. Um, but uh, let's, let's just move out to where the red line crosses 30 and find out where the, the blue line, which is the United States. And that's uh, about 25. Uh, so, and in fact, that's just about w what they really are. So we've got 30 versus 25 at the end of this year. Uh, can anybody do the math for me? The difference is $5 trillion between 30 and 25, right? Okay, proportionately, what is that? Five divided by 25 is what? Five. Let's see, I'm sorry, it's five divided by, by yeah, 20. So uh, we've, we've got uh, roughly 25%. Uh, so the gap between the red line and the blue line at the end of this year will be about 25%. Uh, now we've got the coronavirus to deal with, but that will that will pass eventually, and then this gap will probably continue to widen, and we're already at 25% difference in the size of these economies. Right? That's that's not a small difference any longer, is it? Uh, and as it moves forward, it'll become larger. Uh, and so if you're Toyota, uh, you can still have a good market position in Europe and the United States, these two lines. But if you want to grow, you've got to get on that red line, right? And right. that's going to be an issue, I think, in this presentation. But I'll shut up and give you the next slide. Uh, this is going to be the GDP uh, PPP for the smaller markets that we're looking at. Um, as you can see, Japan is at the top of this list. Uh, Brazil continues to suffer economically as they go through uh, political issues throughout their country. And France and Germany are steadily increasing their purchasing power. Uh, the inflation rate. Um, this is important to know because when inflation is high, people tend uh, to not be able to afford large items such as vehicles. Uh, so it's important to take this into consideration. Uh, one thing to note while going through all of these economic trends that the professor just kind of went over is that China is the growth market of the present while <laughs> India is the growth market of the future. <laughs> um, the future success of Toyota will depend on their ability to grow into the emerging markets and also into China. I've been so impressed by how intelligent this team is. <laughs> um, this is going to be the inflation for the larger economies that we're assessing. Um, you can see that over time the inflation has come down um, and the larger economies do tend to fluctuate together. Uh, it is anticipated that the inflation will not trend off straight like it is right now because the governments continue to print more money. 
Yeah. And then this is the inflation rates for the smaller economies. Um, as you can see, they too are coming down over time. Uh, Brazil and India tend to have higher inflation rates than the European countries. Um, that is partly due to Brazil having the political issues. Uh, and once again, when inflation is high, uh, consumers are not able to make larger purchases such as vehicles. Yeah, um, you said it just right. I, I just wanna make sure that everybody out there in cyberspace got the message. So uh, if the prices of clothing and food, uh, shelter, uh, perhaps transportation, are all real high due to inflation, due to prices, uh, that makes it difficult to afford what folks can get along without, such as a new car, right? That's the significance of, of inflation. It makes it more difficult to sell high-priced products like cars. Um, this is an overview of the population for the eight markets we've been looking at. Um, as you can see, there's a very large gap between uh, China and India and the rest of the countries. Um, India will surpass China and have the largest population in 2022 as their population is growing at a rate of 20%. Um, China's population is growing at 5.6 in the United States at 9.2. <laughs> um, something that is important to note here uh, is that because China and India have such high populations, the individuals do not all have consumption power yet, like the U.S. does. I'm not sure exactly what we've got here. Um, populations don't grow at a rate of 20%, uh, I, certainly not per year. No, that's between, um, that's over time. Over, That's yeah, from this, and from this I'm time wondering period. what time, maybe 10 years. It's the time period just from this graph. Okay. And, in, this, and, in this time period, it represents a growth of 20. Yeah, over over 10 years, that, that, that would be reasonable. Uh, yeah. Okay. And then this is the population for our minor economies. Um, another thing to note is that the U.S. had the uh, lowest population of the major economies with 329 million and Brazil has the highest of the low with 209 million. Um, and over this time period of from 2010 to 2024, um, Brazil's population has grown 11%, uh, France 4.7, Germany 3, and Japan's population is actually decreasing uh, and that is due to um, low reproduction rates and people um, leaving Japan for other opportunities. Yeah, and yet it's a major industrialized nation, but uh, this, this, this is not a, a, a good omen for Japan's future. And this is an overview of the unemployment rate. Um, Brazil has one of the highest unemployment rates consistently while also having a rather high unemployment or high population, high inflation and low uh, purchasing power, making it difficult for residents to purchase vehicles. Um, there's only seven markets shown here and that's because India does not report its unemployment on the IMF and they also only collect their unemployment data about every five years through an independent uh, company called the National Sample Survey Office. Um, the statistics for the unemployment in India are uh, widely, um, they vary widely because they have different uh, rates for how they um, rate their unemployment. Some people might say that they are employed if they work one hour per week, and others may say they're employed if they work 30 hours per 365 days. Uh, good, good points. Um, out of this, uh, oh. I'm sorry. Um, out of this, you can see the United States, um, due to the recession, had a high unemployment rate, but has dropped down in 2020 to the third lowest. And uh, the U.S., Japan, Germany, and China have consistently had the lowest. 
the national saving um, is the sum of corporate profits and personal savings. It is the liquid capital that's available to spend. Um, China consistently has the highest, which is why they are able to invest and have the largest economy. Um, India has the second highest. However, they do not spend a lot of money on their roads and infrastructure. And the US and Brazil have the lowest two. And when you look at all of these graphs together, uh, it's interesting to see that because Brazil also has the highest unemployment, whereas the US consistently has one of the lowest unemployment rates, but still has one of the lowest uh, national savings. Yeah, um, I'm going to do a quick repair here. Um, this will just take a minute, but it's, uh, it's probably important. Uh, the term is, uh, is gross national saving. And although it seems probably not too important to you guys, it actually is. Uh, so let me just, boy, look at me make a big mess. All I'm trying to do is get this little box in the right place. And I'll save it and we'll be on our way. That's pretty close. Okay. Thank you for that. Uh, Thank you. It's, uh, uh, it, as, uh, I've already, I, I'm repeating this for the folks who watch the video. You guys have heard me said it, be, say it before. Uh, <clears throat> but uh, what's remarkable is that uh, uh, corporate profits and, and personal savings, which provide a readily available funds, you know, uh, currency that can be spent right now. Um, and the gross national savings are highest among the, the recognizable nations in China. And uh, it's no surprise that we see also in China uh, with lots of infrastructure uh, development going on all the time. Uh, and this does, in fact, include highways. Uh, it's interesting also uh, that India is as high as it is, so that as India gets going, it uh, should have ample funds for infrastructure development. But we can certainly appreciate uh, why China has those great big wide roads that it does and why there's so much going on in the way of uh, infrastructure construction in China, uh, certainly the funds are, are uh, available to support it. Okay, so now we're gonna be moving into the market analysis. So Toyota's primary sales are in the countries of the United States and Asia Pacific. And um, countries with the greatest importance to Toyota are China and the United States. The United States represents the highest amount of sales while China has the largest purchasing power. And then it's um, also important, oh, it's also oh. important, no, you're fine. Uh, it's important to note that the emerging markets such as India and Brazil are very important. All right. So for this graph here, it's a depiction of the world vehicle production by manufacturer. And you can see Toyota is leading the way with Volkswagen and Hyundai following closely behind. GM is in fourth place. Um, and of course, Toyota is leading with about 10 million <clears throat> in vehicle production. So that's a pretty, pretty good number. Yeah, um, I'm actually, uh, uh, is this production, global production or, China, or production in China? This is going to be a global production. Global? Yes, sir. Okay. Uh, this next slide, it shows you Toyota's market share in the fourth quarter for last year. Uh, they had about 9.63% in Latin America, 9.93% in Asia Pacific, 5.5% in Europe, and 
the largest, which is 13.06 in North America. Okay. The next section is going to cover the market served. So we're going to cover the United States, Japan, China, India, Brazil, France, and Germany. For the United States, the age demographic for new car purchasers is between 25 and 54 years old. According to the Federal Reserve Bank, there's approximately 104 million consumers that fit that category. Um, as mentioned in the previous slide, you know, Toyota has 13.06 market share in the U.S. The Toyota RAV4 is the number one best-selling. <laughs> and unfortunately, um, the U.S. is experiencing a declining market due to buyer searching for larger vehicles. Um, I also believe um, some newly imposed tariff laws uh, by the admit current administration may affect sales uh, with, um, regarding to imports from Japan. So that's also a reason. Um, it's basically a consumer shift. The consumers in the U.S. have shifted towards a more comfortable and more space-oriented SUV or crossover. And according to the research firm uh, J.D. Power & Associates, SUVs and pickups accounted for about 67% of new vehicle retail sales, which depicts a deteriorating smaller sedan market, which also affects Toyota. Uh, Toyota is currently addressing this issue by establishing a joint venture with Mazda uh, here in the U.S., and we'll go more in depth with that joint venture further in the presentation. So this is a customer satisfaction survey um, done in the United States. It shows uh, Lexus and Toyota and then the Toyota Toyota brand, and it compares it to um, other automobiles and light vehicles. So you can see across the board that uh, Lexus leads from year to year, followed closely by Toyota Toyota, um, as compared to all other light vehicles in the United States. Um, this is actually a map that was um, done of a survey of people that were Googling uh, by car brand. And it's interesting um, because the uh, you can see that the dominant presence that Toyota has is along the coast. And uh, those states are actually associated with big cities where the market demand for cars is a lot higher than for trucks. Yeah, that's interesting. And the exception to the rule proves the rule. Illinois, of course, is home to Chicago, right? the second biggest uh, city. So right. uh, interesting point. Uh, this right here is a graphic representation of the 20 best-selling cars and trucks in America in 2018. As you can see, trucks and large SUVs dominate the market. However, Toyota is in fifth place with their RAV4, seventh with the Camry, 10th Corolla, 16th for the Tacoma, and 18th for the Highlander. Uh, they are the only one with five vehicles on this list. For the Japanese market, uh, you can see that, uh, according to the graph on the right, the best-selling cars in Japan, Toyota Prius comes number five, and then it's Toyota's up there a second time with the Toyota Sienta. Uh, the Prius is the number one selling full-size vehicle in the Japanese market. However, the Sienta is, is, is also the number one selling vehicle um, in a different bracket. It's considered uh, in the multi-purpose vehicle bracket, also known as a minivan. Japanese, the vehicles that are manufactured for Japan are considered light automobiles. They're boxier to accommodate smaller highways. Japan is overcrowded, um, so they do have smaller ha highways and it's easier to park smaller vehicles versus the large, the larger vehicles like the Tacomas and the RAV4s and, and vehicles like that. In China, China is probably the most impo important player in the automobile industry. It is the largest producer and consumer of automobiles and also the largest elect electric vehicle and autonomous vehicle market. Um, and the Corolla is the number one selling vehicle in this in, in ch within China. The graph to the right is showing that Toyota isn't really leading the way um, for now. In the future, with some joint ventures with some major players in China, I, 
I feel that it's going to change. Um, so we'll, we'll see about that. And we'll talk about those joint ventures later in the presentation. Um, another market that is served by Toyota is Brazil. Um, Toyota currently has 7.7% of the market share of new passenger cars in Brazil. Uh, their population, it was 210 million uh, with approximately 90 million in the 25 to 54 uh, year old demographics, um, which is the age range for the typical vehicle purchase. Uh, the Yaris, which is the small red car in the bottom right hand corner, is their number one selling small car. And the Helix is their number one selling SUV truck, which is a smaller version of a pickup truck, but a little has higher clearance than a small SUV. Uh, oh, sorry. The last point was that GM leads that market with 19%. Um, Brazil is one of the large, a world's largest emerging economies. Uh, and historically, they have been the strongest economy in South America. Uh, they are a huge opportunity for Toyota as they get their government back in order and are able to get their inflation rates lowered. Um, their large population is a huge potential for sales. Uh, and they're expected to be among the top 10 countries for online automotive aftermarket and part sales. Okay. Um, the red arrow is uh, <laughs> sort of says it all, though. Uh, Toyota certainly has a way to go in Brazil. Yes. Uh, another market served by Toyota is India, and India is a huge opportunity for Toyota as it has 1.351 billion people with 535 million in the demographics age group of 25 to 54 for car purchases. The Glanza, which is the blue car, is their number one selling uh, small car, and the Innova is the number one selling SUV and van, which turned, which initially was a minivan that has converted into a crossover, a long crossover. Um, as you can see, uh, Toyota has a very uh, small market share in India behind uh, Suzuki, Tata, Hyundai, Mahindra, and Mahindra. Yeah, what's uh, in interesting about India is that India's market and industry are not nearly as developed as the U.S. or China, certainly Japan. So uh, that suggests that there may be room for growth in some form. Uh, the uh, it's, it's, it's remarkable that Suzuki is the largest producer of cars in India. Uh, now, one of the interesting things about Suzuki is that it makes two wheelers and three wheelers also. And of course, they account for uh, a lot of the so-called vehicles in, in uh, India. And then we've got these three somewhat equal sized companies um, Mahindra, as I recall, has a joint venture with Ford now, uh, a pretty strong joint venture. Um, and I think, uh, I'm not sure whether, to I think Toyota does have a joint venture uh, in India. You guys will probably educate me on that a little bit later. Um, but uh, uh, India, you know, it, it these, these, if these are the four largest producers in India, and they are, then Toyota or somebody uh, has uh, room to move in and force uh, if they can get approval and cooperation of government agencies, by way of example. Uh, there, it's very difficult to figure out exactly what to do in India. Uh, because it's so big and yet its development is so uh, unstable and uh, unfinished. Uh, India has the potential uh, to become the world's third largest automobile market by 2030. Um, they are the second largest two-wheeler manufacturer and two-wheelers sell 21 to 1 compared to automobiles. 
Um, pictured on the left, uh, the top is a Mahindra and Mahindra three-wheeler, which is uh, very popular in India. And the bottom picture is a Toyota electric three-wheeler uh, that is currently being tested to be promoted in India. That is, uh, I have not seen the, the, this uh, new Toyota. Uh, it's a three-wheeler, huh? But it's, yes, very, it's very narrow, isn't it? It's a one-passenger car. <laughs> um, unless it has a back seat. I, I think that um, in some of the pictures, it looked like the door opened and there was either a cargo space behind the seat or room for one passenger, but it looks like it'd be a pretty tight fit. No car seats back there, for sure. It's, it's a fascinating idea. It'd be real interesting to see how that goes. Um, and from what you've learned, it's not in India yet, but it's being, uh, it's being tested in Japan before it gets to India? Yes, it's being tested in Japan specifically for India. Mm -hmm. um, and then the last thing to point out about India is that General Motors actually withdrew uh, as they didn't feel it was a profitable enough market. Uh, in France, uh, another market served. Uh, Toyota has 4.9% of the market share for cars and 1.64 light trucks. Uh, the Yaris is the top picture and it accounts for 38% of the total Toyota sales in France. Uh, in Germany, Toyota only has 2.4% of the auto market and 1.34 trucks. And that is mostly due to Germany being home to Volkswagen Group, making it difficult for Toyota to penetrate the market. Uh, okay. And same as in France, the uh, Yaris is the number one seller. Okay. So the next section will cover health and safety concerns related to Toyota. Um, from 1998 to 2002, uh, the Camry was only a two-star vehicle, and now it is five stars due to Toyota's drive for safety. To further health and safety concerns, <clears throat> Toyota is trying to match up with what car shoppers want as far as advanced safety features. Um, and their features like forward collision warning, automatic emergency braking, blind spot warning, lane departure warning, lane keeping assist, and rear cross traffic warning. Buyers um, do value the blind spot monitoring rear view cameras the most. Automation is actually the least for the U.S. Um. Safety is embedded into Toyota. They have a strong sense of quality assurance and quality control. Um, the Toyota Safety Sense is one of their safety programs, and they also have programs for youth to teach them how to drive, as well as the elderly to stay sharp. Um, they have innovative safety features because they believe that crash protection comes from crash prevention. Um, on, the, on the left, you can just see uh, they have a zero accidents and zero loss work days for their employees. So they take safety from the manufacturing all the way out to their consumer. Okay. Uh, and then this is just one of their uh, quality vehicle inspections. You've got your inspector on the left and the bottom is a depiction of their new quality vision for 2020. Um, their product quality includes safety, eco-friendliness, durability, ease of use, and workmanship. Um, and their quality vision 2020, there was a statement that said a product should never be sold unless it has been carefully manufactured and fully tested in commercial trials with completely satisfying results. And that is part of the Toyota way. <laughs> The next section will uh, cover consumer buying intentions. Um, this is a uh, depiction of the consumer buying intentions for electric vehicles and plug-in hybrids. Um, as you can see, uh, China has the highest sales 
Uh, they are trying to contain their air pollution and they have a heavy focus on electric and plug-ins. Uh, Japan uh, is up towards the top, um, but they're in there. Um, they do not have any of their own fossil fuels. All of their gas is imported. So um, they're trying to get away from that. Um, in the US on the top 20, 2018 vehicles, uh, no hybrids were listed as uh, in the US, there's a heavy focus on uh, larger trucks and SUVs and electrics and hybrids are almost thought of as an exotic, just not used to the normal. And I wanted to note Norway, even though we weren't focusing on them much, um, they have a significantly high um, EV sales because their government uh, offers a lot of incentives for electric vehicles. Yeah, I was struck when I saw the electric vehicles per capita or per thousand people. You may actually have that statistic here somewhere, but uh, Norway really stands out. Um, we put some information about Tesla in here. Uh, it's important to know how the competition is moving and this is a huge move for Tesla. Uh, they built their Gigafactory 3, which is their first production site outside of the United States and China. Uh, it has a, poten the potential market in China is huge and Tesla, or China is Tesla's number two market behind the US. And this is just an uh, exterior of the factory and the interior. The size of the factory is 121 football fields. It's massive. It is massive. It's in Shanghai. Uh, and, and it's estimated to produce up to 500,000 uh, vehicles per year. Um, this was just important to note because Tesla's already starting to make moves in China. The next section is going to be the industry structure. We're going to go over sales, operating margin, ROI, ROE, and leverage. And then we'll also do the BCG matrix, industry life cycle, industry, CSF, technology trends, and then Porter Spy Forces and Scorecard. Uh, the financial trends that are gonna be presented in the next slides uh, were compiled uh, data from Value Line. Um, some things to note are how some companies are able to operate with a higher operating margin. Uh, one thing that we mentioned earlier is that Toyota's never really been uh, they have never really been concerned with having the highest operating margin, but more of a legacy. So they keep a really uh, narrow window of where they operate for a lot of their uh, statistics. Uh, their operating margin is third in this list behind GM and Tata with the highest. And they have the second highest leverage, third highest leverage, sorry, behind lowest leverage, uh, while Ford has the highest leverage. And we'll go into all of these in the next few slides. Um, this is the sales for the industry. Uh, Toyota has the highest sales by nearly 100 million in revenues. And this is a depiction of the operating margin. As you can see, Tata Motors has the highest operating margin. Um, However, uh, Toyota made nearly five times the profits that Tata did. Um, the, the analysts don't really believe that margin for Tata. Um, <clears throat> and that's because Tata has uh, unused capacity too. Uh, and uh, exactly how that number is calculated compared to the others uh, is a little suspect. Over and above that, uh, we need to remember that Tata isn't uh, as large as the other companies here. So we can look at Tata's numbers, but, uh, uh, and, and there will come a time when we're gonna have to look at them a lot more closely. But right now, I think what, what you wanna do is just look at uh, the operating margins of General Motors and Toyota uh, and Toyota, uh, frankly, when you're, when you're over 10% in this industry, you're doing pretty well. Um, there's a, a something remarkable in this chart, 
although the way the chart's constructed, you wouldn't naturally uh, uh, catch it. But General Motors hasn't always been at this level of operating margin. Uh, and it's only since uh, Mrs. Mary Barra has become the CEO that General Motors has uh, become so profitable. And Mrs. Barra basically changed uh, General Motors' philosophy, which had been to be the biggest manufacturer in the world, and for a, quite a while it was. Uh, Mrs. Barra realizes that the, the company's not in business to be the biggest, it's, uh, it's in business to make a profit. And so General Motors has withdrawn from India, for instance, uh, as well as uh, uh, most of the UK and South America. And it's focusing on markets that are profitable, such as China. And uh, the, as, it's, as it's made these changes, its profit margin has come up. In this industry, if you can get a 15% operating margin, you're printing money. Uh, that's really just a fan. It's unusual. You can see the normal uh, could be reaching for 10%. So uh, both Toyota and General Motors are doing spectacularly well in this chart. Uh, the next thing we're going to talk about is the leverage of these competitors. Um, Toyota has a financial leverage of 33.9% and only Fiat with 24 and Honda with 33 have a lower leverage than them. Um, they're in a great position financially to be uh, strategically aggressive with their competitors with this low leverage. So what's your, your opinion of perhaps Ford? Um, Ford could struggle if uh, the coronavirus really continues. Um, they're not able to go and make investments like other companies are because they do have such high leverage. Um, same with General Motors, theirs has, has come down some as their, their new um, president, as you were just discussing, um, has, I guess, come into office. Yeah, um, you, me you mentioned the coronavirus. If, if Ford's sales drop, uh, a great deal, it may be unable to service its debt. Yes, sir. Um, it's not the only one with that problem. General Motors has it too, and so does Daimler. Uh, but then we take a look at Toyota and realize that Toyota has a lot more flexibility strategically. And as you say, if when the time comes, it can be strategically aggressive when the others cannot. Uh, for the return on investment, uh, the rate of return on investment measures the productivity of the invested capital. Uh, Tesla and Tata uh, have a near existent, uh, non existent ROI, mm -hmm. and Toyota continues to have an ROI above 7%. Uh, and another thing to uh, note that when uh, times are tough, similar to what we might experience with the corona, um, companies with high levels of debt, uh, it makes it difficult for them to be strategically aggressive again. Yeah. We'd, we'd like to see that the, the, this industry suffers from low ROI. Uh, it's because it's so asset intensive, but boy, we'd sure like to see those numbers, even the, from the good companies, come up a little more. And then for our return on equity, uh, this is the return, uh, means the rate of growth with the shareholders' equity. Uh, GM recently was able to increase their ROE due to pulling out of areas that are not profitable and focusing on existing markets. Um, and another thing to note, one of those windows that Toyota stays in is to have their ROE above 10%. Yeah, uh, uh, good, good point. I guess that's good enough. Yeah. Um, one, one thing that uh, just uh, as, a, as an old industry analyst, let me point out to you, um, we, today we have a, a, a nice low priced capital market uh, where interest rates of three and four percent are pretty common for capital investments, maybe maybe four and a half or five. Uh, <clears throat> but uh, that hasn't always been the case. Uh, interest rates for 10 year loans, for instance, could be seven, eight percent, something of that sort. 
so if your Toyota, uh, which is doing well, uh, has a rate of return on invested capital of 7.5%, back in the old days, if it cost you 6 or 7%, uh, in order to invest money at 7%, that's not exactly cutting a fat hog, is it? Uh, now, the reason that that's interesting is because of the time we live in today. And I think I've explained to this team, but again, for those watching the video, um, as the U.S. government prints money, puts more money into circulation, Recently, we've had an increase uh, of about $7 trillion on top of a, of a GDP of, uh, per, call it 21. That's an increase of about a third. Uh, so you've got that much more currency chasing an economy that has come down in goods and services. More, cap, more currency, less goods and services. And the way we calculate price is currency divided by what you're buying, goods and services. That's the definition of price. So over time here, as the coronavirus works its way through, uh, we're gonna be left with this great big amount of currency and a relatively subdued amount of economic output. The consequence has to be an increase in prices, dollars divided by goods, or dollars uh, divided by hours of service, but it's dollars per product. And that's the definition of price. And based on that, we can expect prices which will force interest rates up. So if we've got uh, a rate of return of, call it 7%, it may be in the not too distant future that we'll be seeing interest rates of 7%. That makes it very difficult for industrial corporations like Toyota and more difficult for corporations like Ford or Nissan uh, to borrow money at 7% and get a return on that investment that justifies uh, the investment in the first place. So we're about to come on to a time when the logic, the ability of firms to make capital investments uh, is gonna be very different from today. Uh, so although we see that, that uh, Toyota is doing okay with seven and a half percent, I mentioned earlier that we'd like to see Toyota's rate of return come up uh, and that's what's behind my comment. We know what's coming in the future. It's higher interest rates. And in a, in a world like that, uh, we're going to need higher rates of return in order to afford the capital we invest. Sorry for that long-winded diatribe, but it's important. Thank you. Thank you, she said. <laughs> Okay. Good info. <laughs> <laughs> when she's, re when she's really thinking, damn, I wish he'd shut up so we can get done with it. No, I was thinking, I wish I would have said it myself. Man, that would have been good. If I would have gone off like that, you would have been so impressed with me. <laughs> but they're really aggressive. Yep. Yep. Here we are at the BCG matrix. So the BCG matrix is used to analyze business units. So for Toyota, we see that um, models such as the Camry and the Corolla are the cash cows, while um, the Celica, which was uh, marketed toward the youth, and then also the Crown and Tundra are the, are the poor dogs. And then we have vehicles such as the Scion, which is also geared towards uh, the youth in America and then biofuels and solar powered vehicles, and then also small cars for India are your question marks, while your stars would be your luxury brand such as Lexus, and then your Prius hybrid, and then also the Land Cruiser SUV. This is a depiction of the industry life cycle. Uh, we have our development, growth, shakeout, maturity, and decline phases. And I'm just gonna go over a few of the points within each phase. So right now in development, the main thing is alternate fuels, solar is the newest one that there people are working on, autonomous 
autonomous vehicles are a big one. So Tesla, Hyundai, and then Pony AI is what we have a um, joint venture, which we'll go into detail later about. Um, as far as in the growth stage, uh, electric, that's something that's really growing, going, picking up steam. We have a few companies that were like the, uh, the treading the waters first. And it seems like that's something where everyone's going through. So it's a high growth. So Prius has a, a Prius Prime, which is a fully electric vehicle that they're developing too. That's kind of marketing. Um, in the shakeout phase, I have hybrids. Uh, some companies did really well, like Toyota, and others uh, didn't do it so well. So with Ford, the C-Max was one of those models that they tried. It was supposed to be a competitor for the uh, Prius, but did not do well. And so that's currently not in production right now. Uh, as far as maturity, our standard gas vehicles, our sedans, uh, trucks, pickups, things like that, they're, all, they're at their peak. They're kind of just hanging out. And lastly would be decline. Uh, I wanted to just throw in there with the ethanol. That was a new, that was like the new thing, corn, kind of using that as a fuel. Uh, that really didn't pan out as well. And it still contributes to greenhouse emissions too. So that's another thing why electric is this new, this new wave we're all riding right now. So this slide talks about the critical success factors for the industry. So those include electrical engineering, um, which mostly talks about the industry and the automakers in the industry having the ability to develop electric powered vehicles. And then we also have uh, mechanical and design engineering uh, that would cover things such as safety, fuel, uh, fuel efficiency, and then an overall appeal in the design of the vehicle. Uh, government relations are also a critical factor uh, just because the <laughs> automaker would need to be able to handle issues that come up, such as fuel efficiency standards. Um, growth in China is essential um, just because of how important uh, China is in the automotive uh, market. And then last would be the access to the latest available technology. Um, because of how highly competitive the industry is, if you don't have that latest technology or don't have asset, assets to it or the way to develop it, um, you're really gonna start to lag behind. Um, this is the uh, success factor scorecard. So um, as you can see, Toyota, uh, as far as like the growth in China, um, we have them at a three just due to those historical cultural um, relations. Um, also, another thing that I thought was interesting in doing the research on this is um, actually wrong. This is the wrong one. I'm getting ahead of myself. <laughs> um, but overall, you can see that Toyota scores very high in the electrical engineering and also uh, mechanical and design engineering. Sure. Um, aside from the fact that you've got GM rated uh, best, which is quite reasonable. Um, the other thing that strikes me about your results here is that just how closely matched these companies are. Yes. They're all pretty good, aren't they? Yes, and that's actually what I was going to say um, related to GM is the reason that um, GM and Ford, we'll see it in a later slide for technology especially, is due to their advances with the um, self-driving vehicles compared to the other competitors. Mm -hmm. Technology trends. So this is something that uh, we we're discussing and just kind of the slide really just depicts a little bit of where things are going, what people are wanting, what kind of what the industry is calling for. Uh, autonomy is a big thing, being connected, whether it's uh, having internet connection within your phone, your vehicle, uh, fully electric vehicles or hybrids, and then that shared experience through your phone with an app. Okay. This is just a general snapshot of what's, what's out there right now. Things that stood out to me were predictive maintenance. So now you have a computer or some kind of technology that can tell you what part needs to be replaced when your maintenance is needed things of that nature. You also have 3D printing, which I'm going to go into details about as far as parts and what that can mean. Um, data and security is something that as the technology advances, you also have to have security. So uh, I know there's companies that actually want hackers to try to hack into their systems so they can find loopholes oh. and ways to kind of improve their systems because uh, it gets, that's the last thing you want someone to do is take over your self-driving vehicles. So uh, right. it's just a snapshot there. 
Yeah. So there's five trends that are continuing right now. As the first one actually really makes sense with the current state of the um, coronavirus right now. So there's a virtual reality and augmented reality showrooms. So you can literally visit vehicles from the comfort of your home, kind of go inside it even without leaving the, your house. And so that's something that keeps up with the production and making sure people can still make those purchases. Connected vehicles, you have Wi-Fi, anyone that can go in the vehicle has internet, has um, ways to communicate, not only for the vehicle itself, but for map and GPS processes. Uh, again, advanced safety, Lisa had a good slide about the safety features, which is like a uh, lane assist, pedestrian assist, like even in the dark, they can see things that uh, the AI systems can see things that we can't. So a lot of those things are very important and it's really trending to, about safety, not just for us, but the pedestrians and everyone around. Uh, personalized driving experience, being able to walk into your car, even before you even turn it on, the car knows it's you, have your favorite soundtrack or playlist waiting for you to turn on as you drive to work. Uh, that, that personalized experience is getting more uh, of like an extra factor people are not knowing they need it until they have it. And so now it's there and it's very, very popular. And lastly, which the implications of 3D printing with parts is very important. Uh, you have parts that instead of having being shipped from another distribution center can actually print it in shop for, it takes hours, but definitely a few days, definitely quicker um, than having to go and get it apart from somewhere else. Yeah, that uh, last one is, uh, is uh, beginning to make a real difference. Uh, uh, I've witnessed it in automotive plants and uh, it's, it's really great that, it, that you, can, uh, you can develop a, perhaps a prototype for a part, check it out, uh, and uh, uh, next thing you know, you've got the tool, you know, the master that goes into the machine uh, that the uh, machine is going to duplicate many times. Uh, as it's uh, producing parts uh, from uh, bar stock steel, uh, you know, to produce that first uh, model, that that uh, that uh, initial tool, the prototype, uh, in the past could take a very long time, and now uh, it does not take so long. So um, this slide is showing Porter's five forces. And um, Porter's five forces model enables strategists to do three things. And that is the first, that they diagnose the profit potential of an industry by ident identifying economic forces that suppress industry profit. Next, they, um, based on that profit potential, they decide whether or not to enter an industry or a country or a geographic region. And then the last thing is after performing the analysis, they identify strategic priorities to overcome um, profit suppressing forces. So with Toyota, we see that as far as bargaining uh, power of customers, we have a low switching cost and a large quantity of brand information. And then for the bargaining power suppliers, uh, Toyota has high integration limits for suppliers, which is a weak force, and then a large overall supply for production, which is also a weak force. For um, competitive rivalry within an industry, uh, the automotive industry is highly aggressive, and the firms are aggressive within the industry, so that would be a strong force. And then the high variety and differentiation between the brands is also a strong force. And then the low number of large forms, also a strong force. For the threat of substitute products, you have um, low switching costs, moderate force, and then the moderate availability of substitutes, also moderate force. And then your threat of new entrants, uh, because the capital to enter the market is so high, that represents a weak force. And then also high would be brand development. And then you have the high, high supply, or supply chain costs. Okay, and I think you're going to show us a chart for countries here. Um, is that true? Uh, uh, yes. Yeah. yeah. And, uh, so when we're talking about the, the substitutes, of course, that'll differ between countries. So uh, perhaps when we see India, we'll see those uh, two-wheelers and three-wheelers come into play. Yes. 
Yeah, so like you just um, mentioned, the threat of substitutes is very high in India due to the uh, majority use of three-wheelers. And then you also see that the rivalry among competitors is lower um, in India compared to the other countries just because companies are realizing that, you know, they don't have the capital to buy those vehicles. Um, also, just in general, based on this analysis, the auto industry profit potential is highest in China and lowest in India, but you notice that there's not a large difference, like you said earlier, so that would lead us to being able to have a global strategy that's just standardized across the board. Good point. When you've got uh, rivals that are this closely matched uh, around the world, it's, uh, it's a lot easier to adopt that global rather than a multinational or even a transnational strategy. So uh, you made that point really well. I think there's something about that in the test. So the um, next section is gonna be the capabilities analysis. We're gonna go over financial trends, the building blocks of competitive advantage, resources, and then strength and weaknesses. Uh, we previously discussed the financial trends of the industry uh, with data provided from Value Line, and this is going to be uh, Toyota specific. So as you can see, um, their sales have uh, risen from 2015 to 2017 and then kind of tapered off, uh, which is partly due to the saturation in the US market. Um, we've got their operating margin, which is staying between uh, almost 16 and 13% and leveraging off um, their ROI and ROE, both pretty um, within the range that they, they like to stay in. Um, they don't require themselves to be highly profitable. Uh, they invest heavily in R&D, and they're not a greedy company when it comes to their profit margin. Uh, their leverage, they're strategically aggressive. <laughs> they're able to be strategically they aggressive. Be. They can be. Um, their low uh, leverage uh, allows Toyota to be strategically aggressive um, when they're ready to be. Yeah. Lately, uh, they haven't been that aggressive, uh, and yet they have all this ability. So it's kind of like you're waiting for something to go boom. Waiting uh, for the next know, big move. Someday Toyota is going to go boom, and the rest of the world's going to have to watch them. <laughs> um, so these are going to be the building blocks of competitive advantage. So we have efficiency, quality, innovation, and customer responsiveness. So specific to Toyota, you have the Toyota production system um, under efficiency, and it was designed specifically to create the most efficient manufa manufacturing process as possible. And then for quality, uh, the TPS system also falls into quality, but in general, Toyota considers quality to be the lifeblood of their company. Um, this is evident through their focus on quality of every level, including design, manufacturing, marketing, and management. Um, in innovation, Toyota is one of the top spenders in terms of research and development, and they pride themselves on that continual um, advancement and development. And then lastly, with customer responsiveness, Toyota offers completely customizable vehicles, and you even see that with the fact that they offer um, that that first product that we talked about, which is for the elderly or handicapped. Um, they also use this extensive R&D budget to properly assess the needs and wants of their customers, uh, whether it be through just watching market demand um, or you know, knowing what the, the person wants in the area they're in. I think the Prius probably is one of the most dramatic examples of customer responsiveness. Uh, customers wanted uh, electric power, but they were afraid that the battery would run out. And so you got a hybrid. Um, and uh, it's, it, while gasoline was very expensive, that thing was pretty successful, at least in its latest version. Right, yeah, and you can actually see that point through this scorecard where customer responsiveness, Toyota um, has a five. Good and, point. Uh, and also, you'll notice that Volkswagen has a five. When I was um, doing the research, it was actually interesting how many times the um, level of 
uh, customer service related to being able to answer customer complaints or customer needs came up with Toyota and Volkswagen neck and neck um, with that type of responsiveness and customer service. Very good. Okay. And here we don't have things so quite so tightly packed. Right. You got somebody at the top and you got somebody at the bottom. Yes. Yeah. <clears throat> This next slide explains uh, Toyota's resources between capital, physical, human, and technology. Um, they have invested in several, probably hundreds of thousands industrial robots um, that help with automation. They've got about 20 research and development centers globally, about 14 manufacturing facilities in North America, and they also hold about 23,000 patents involving the electri electrified vehicle technology development, which is the up and coming market. Wow. So this is just a kind of a map of showing to get you a visual of how things are lying around in um, Toyota's world. So we have our, the bottom left corner map is just pretty much just the production uh, manufacturing sites where everything is produced and they're scattered throughout a lot of the, the globe, uh, which we'll go into later about their organization structure, which makes it a little bit more complicated. But knowing that, that they can produce a lot in the US and South America, Europe, China, all those areas, they're able to bypass some tariff costs that we were kind of um, worried about, especially depending on the time. Um, and then the right map over there has the research and development sites. Uh, just a few of them there, but they're all pretty much in their major sectors. So you have U.S., Europe, China, Japan, Asia, and even one in Australia. So. so we chose to look at Toyota uh, with a SWOT analysis. It is important um, to note that we learned that you don't use SWOT analysis in the field. Um, <laughs> however, when it comes to this presentation, it was it was really helpful in helping us identifying what the strength, weaknesses, opportunity, and threats would be related to Toyota. Okay. So if you want to go to the next slide, I'm going to oh, okay, yeah. uh, go sure. into detail. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So um, one of the strengths is going to be Toyota's research and development. So you can see from the graph that um, Toyota is a leader in research and development but they're also uh, very efficient as reflected um, in the relatively low percent of revenue being consumed uh, by the research and development compared to their rivals. No, very effective and yet not too expensive. Another strength is gonna be Toyota's recognizable brand. So they're recognized as one of the most um, valuable brands in the world. And a great deal of this recognition stems from the number of awards they've accumulated over the years for features such as safety, design, innovation, and eco-friendliness. And on this um, chart, you can see that they're number one. The third strength is related to Toyota's production system, also called TPS. So um, this was developed in order to increase efficiency and simplify processes in the area of uh, manufacturing. It's based on the just-in-time concept, which we talked about earlier. Um, it focuses on eliminating waste. Um, because it's so efficient, it is able to lower uh, Toyota's operating cost, um, and that allows them to have a, a higher operating profit margin than its competitors. So you can see Toyota um, with the blue uh, line, and that's just showing uh, the profit margin, operating profit margin comparison. The next strength is going to be electric vehicles. Uh, Toyota is heavily invested in its electric vehicles and have sold more than any other automotive company in the world. Currently, they offer over 30 electrified vehicle types, most of which are hybrids. And you can see um, how popular, so like the, the Prius makes up 24% of um, those electrified vehicles. The last strength is going to be dependability. So this is actually a uh, study that was done by J.D. Power in 2018, and it um, talks about the number of problems that uh, vehicles have. So you can see Lexus um, has 99 problems per 100 vehicle vehicles, while Toyota um, has 127. 
And then the industry average is actually towards the middle at 144, which Lexus and Toyota are both well below. Right. So one weakness that Toyota does have is autonomous vehicles. Uh, you can see that uh, some of their main competitors, such as Ford and GM, are, are a lot further along. You see them in the leaders um, box in the green. And um, Toyota is pursuing the idea, uh, but they really didn't start until like 2015. So everyone else had a head start. Rather interesting where we see Tesla also. Yes, <laughs> very far behind. Um, so as we've talked about, the, this lack of presence in China is just a reoccurring issue. Um, again, it, this cultural barrier that exists um, that was established during World War II, uh, they've been able, uh, been unable to, you know, establish a dominant presence in the Chinese market due to it. And given the importance of the market in relation to the automotive industry, uh, it, it really puts Toyota at a, at a disadvantage. It sure does. And uh, we see that GM and Volkswagen are are virtually tied in this chart. And yes. that's that's essentially the real world. Those are the two leaders in China. Interesting. So another weakness is going to be the limited brand portfolio that Toyota has. As you can see, um, they have four brands, which um, only you know Toyota and Lexus are the most well known. So the reason that this is actually a weakness is because a lot of um, times when something goes wrong with a particular brand, uh, companies so like General Motors, for example, they would have an easier time uh, potentially pushing another model. So like if Chevrolet, something went wrong with Chevrolet, there was a recall, they could say, oh, well, look at GMC, we're still doing really well with GMC. Whereas Toyota is at a disadvantage where as far as that PR and the marketing, they don't have the advantage of pushing the bad press off, you know, and still being okay. Well, that's an interesting concept. Okay. Um, so a, a big opportunity is going to be the development in the Asian market. Uh, currently, Toyota only has 5% in India's market, which is growing steadily. And, um, they have about the same in the in the Chinese market. Uh, by 2030, it is predicted that Asia's share of the world's middle class population is predicted to double. Uh, this uh, this has a significant opportunity for Toyota, given that they could meet that automotive need um, of the new middle class population in in these countries. Yeah, and uh, Toyota's headquarters, its home, is in Asia. Right. So we would expect Toyota to have more access to these markets than the Americans do, for instance, right. or the Germans. And yet in China, what do we see? General Motors and Volkswagen tied for the lead with shares three times Toyota's. Now we understand why Toyota has such a small share. It's cultural. Uh, at the end of the day, it's cultural. It certainly isn't because Toyota lacks design engineering competence. Toyota's a leader in design engineering in this industry. It's the one that brought you the Prius. So, uh, you know, how does how does does Toyota overcome that? And it's it's not as obvious as you would think because, uh, you know, if if it's just China, then. Why don't we, we would like to see Toyota doing well elsewhere in Southeast Asia, for instance. Uh, but Toyota really needs to, to just rethink this thing. Um, <clears throat> but it's, uh, uh, for, for Toyota, this is an existential problem. Uh, Toyota today is the world's leading auto manufacturer. But with the growth in Asia and Southeast Asia and India, the way uh, expected to be so rapid compared to the rest of the world, uh, Toyota needs to figure out how to do business in Asia and to uh, increase its market shares in Asian countries, or it won't be the largest auto manufacturer in the world 
perhaps as soon as five years from now, certainly, right. certainly 10 years from now. So for Toyota, what we're talking about it comes close to being an existential problem. So another opportunity is uh, the self-driving cars. Um, as of 2017, there were approximately 44 companies working on this technology, including Toyota. And um, although Toyota wasn't amongst the latest companies to start working on developing these vehicles, um, they're hoping to have a self-driving vehicle by late 2020. Um, this is really important considering that the global interest for these types of vehicles continues to rise and the new technology could really uh, prove uh, lucrative to Toyota. Mm. So one of the first threats is um, intense competition. The automotive industry competition is con continuing to intensify due to the technological changes and the excess vehicle production. In 2017, there was an estimated global excess production capacity of 34 million units. Um, and then you also have uh, companies such as Apple and Google who are you know, non-automotive uh, trying to enter the market through developments in their in-car technology and future vehicle development. Uh, government regulations is also a threat to Toyota. Uh, because the automotive industry is highly susceptible to regulations, um, environmentally, environmentally driven policies uh, continue to increase and uh, Toyota could see their cost of operations and production um, increase along with these regulations. Uh, lastly, the um, economic and political volatility poses a threat to Toyota because they generate 60% of their income uh, our, I'm sorry, their total revenue outside of Japan. Uh, so they're vulnerable to international economic or political conditions. This includes local government regulations, import controls, um, or rising interest rates. The next section is going to be on organizational structure. All right, so organizational structure. So we've talked about Japan's culture and how they're really set in the, the ways, how everyone's done it in the past. Uh, most businesses in Japan are centrally um, organized. So you'll have the main headquarters and then all the information gets disseminated across the different sectors. Toyota has had to change over the years because of its growth, because of its global uh, impact. So they're more of a decentralized workplace. Today. Now going into what this looks like. So for most of their departments and divisions, you have open communication across different functional levels, definitely seniority levels. So they're definitely trying to increase that um, <clears throat> trade of information within the organization to make it run smoothly. Uh, they actually encourage a lot of feedback from their employees, uh, constructive criticism is taken well, just to make sure they're continually improving that whole mindset of, uh, the TPS process, Toyota way, they're always wanting to get the people from the floor on there and give them that feedback. We also have plant directors. They're encouraged to go on the floor daily. And I'm gonna probably pronounce this wrong, but Genki Jibutsu is what uh, a saying, which means go see for yourself. And that's the philosophy that a lot of those uh, floor managers, plant directors have. Yeah, we're good. Uh, so they have a Toyota, global hierarchy. Uh, this actually was introduced in 2013, just to kind of restructure everything to have a little bit more, uh, uh, kind of, I'm not gonna say standardized, but just to have it definitely more intense for every little uh, sector that they have. We have the decision-making uh, power, uh, decision-making areas where they're regional heads, they all have different people making the calls, not, this is kind of encouraging the decentralized um, organization is structural. Uh, the geographic divisions, there's eight of them. We have Japan, North America, Europe, East Asia, Oceania, China, Asia, Middle East, Africa, Latin America, Latin America, and the Caribbean. And then within that, there's a product division based. There's four groups. We have Lexus International. The Toyota Group number one is in charge of North America, Europe, and Japan. Uh, Toyota Group covers all the other regions. And then finally, the unit center, which is responsible for engines, transmissions, and other related operations. What's the most important change here? The most important change? 
Yeah, where, where, where has the most dramatic, most substantial change occurred? I'll say it's the also the most divisions. important. Huh? The geographic divisions? Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, you know, at, at the beginning, uh, Toyota was successful because it was able to come to the United States and offer small cars and grew like a rocket, like a little weed, grew into a big weed. Uh, but uh, over time, uh, Toyota has attempted to be and has succeeded in being a global player in all parts of the world. And its original organization structure it wasn't consistent with that. You, you can't give direct, uh, 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 direct orders or, or unit, uniform or, or a, a single directed direction <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, uh, in, a, in a conventional uh, organization structure because each one of those geographic areas uh, is distinct and has to operate distinctly in response to local market conditions, uh, regulations, and so forth. Uh, and so, uh, unlike the past, the folks who, who direct, who manage these geographic divisions, uh, may sometimes even be called uh, president of Toyota uh, Africa, you know? Uh, but, uh, uh, you know, that, that executive becomes much more important, has much more authority than executives in the field have had in the past. Uh, I'm sorry, I, I really made a mess of that, but uh, the, uh, uh, this, this uh, development of the geographic structure uh, has been a major, major change philosophically as well as operationally. Uh, for Toyota. Uh, what's really remarkable to those of us who observe is that Toyota pulled this off so well. It's contrary to the way Toyota and other Japanese companies have been formed in the past, but Toyota did it. And uh, the most remarkable part is it has not been remarkable. It's just happened. Here we have the result. Mm -hmm. So this is the uh, matrix organization structure that is yeah. consistent within every all the divisions, um, and I did add a second. You portion. are you guys really have responded to our conversation. <laughs> I saw that with a little stuff over on the side about the uh, the the effects of the five forces. She took us through it, and damn, that was that was exactly the way we went through it the other night. So. Mm -hmm. uh, Maybe I haven't indicated this to you, but I am very grateful for your responsiveness to our conversations. And now here we find the three-dimensional matrix. Tell yep. us about the three-dimensional matrix for him. Mm -hmm. So within those geographic divisions, um, thank you, by the way. Um, very good team we have going on here. Uh, between the geographic divisions, uh, within each division, you have the departments where there's people in charge of styling, body engineering, interior, powertrain, all that within each model. So then now you're going up the graph, which is like different models. Project X could be just anything, Tacoma, Corolla, Lexus. And so those are all very interweaved, thus the matrix structure. But with Toyota, it's even more complicated because within each geographic division, they have something similar to this. So it's definitely geared towards each area but they can better serve that market by doing it this way so the okay. original mindset that J the toyota had going into it years ago could definitely not work so the 2013 change really was key um, to yeah. making all this happen and right out of your textbook uh the the issue here is complexity and uh it's uh you know the matrix organizations have brought Company, many companies to their knees. Uh, and after attempting it, they gave up and went back to something else. But there are industries that just require matrix organizations. There are other industries that can benefit from them, but you've got to really do it well. One of the things that enables a company to do a matrix organization well is what Toyota has, culture.
okay? Toyota is, uh, if, you're, if you're part of the Toyota organization, you're part of a family, you know, you're part of something that's almost religious. Um, all those philosophical things we were talking about earlier about feeling the, you know, the, the mission and the, the, of the corporation and what its purpose is and so forth. Uh, it's because of that culture and that, that integration, that social psychological integration uh, that Toyota can, can make uh, a three-dimensional matrix work. Lots of companies, including American companies, just couldn't do it. Toyota can do it. Uh, and that's, that's, that's really impressive. Along the lines of uh, where they're working on, we have autonomous vehicles. Uh, there's actually one that's developed. Uh, I think this is actually genius with using the Lexus as a brand for this autonomous vehicle. That's already, we saw in a lot of those slides previously that the it's the one with the least problems, the, has the highest rate of cu customer satisfaction. So by moving towards this, this is a prototype obviously, but um, they're working on that right now. Uh, level four capabilities means that there's still someone in the vehicle as they're trying to work with the autonomous thing, but they're just more of just observing, not necessarily um, doing any of the driving. Along those same lines, electric vehicles are a big thing. Well, how do you power electric vehicles? We have our battery development. So that's been another big thing that they've been working on uh, to make this really move forward. And later on, we'll discuss more about um, what that looks like exactly. Uh, Toyota already, they promised to have five, or in five years to have a complete line of fully electric vehicles. Uh, they actually have two that rolled out in China, which is very, very smart. Um, and uh, brands that were actually really popular too for Toyota over there. So the CHR and the Izoa, um, fully electric vehicles that they have rolling out, you can find them now over there. Uh, battery power, uh, that's what the main thing, that's the main goal, how we yeah. keep these cars moving. Uh, yep. there, there's a few strategic uh, joint ventures and, and um, actually, uh, I, I lost my, my train of thought there, but they're working with a couple of companies to be able to be able to produce the batteries. So they're work, not just working on the vehicles, but how to get that supply going because once they get rolling, they're going to need to be able to, to produce it well. And here is the secret ingredient, right? Yep. We're working with a Chinese company, a very strong a uh, well-established Chinese company. That's exactly what Toyota needs to get over the finish line, right? Because yeah. that helps to overcome this cultural problem. And, and lastly in this section, uh, this is more of just kind of discussing a lot of what didn't work well, uh, the communications issue, and that's what was really established in 2013, kind of make sure that that works well, but they did have uh, issues with their brake or accelerator sticking. And so the problem with that is that the information was being sent that this was a problem, but the upper management wasn't getting that information. So it kind mm -hmm. of spiraled and became this huge big thing. And before you know it, there's this huge recall for a brand that was really doing well. And so um, that's kind of one of those things where the new organization structure really helped. Uh, push, I don't want to say accelerate, but accelerated making sure that happened. So, yeah, it might've been that, uh, that problem that made the, the matrix uh, happen more immediately. That, and that may be just what you said. Okay. Uh, the next section is going to be goals and that'll cover the goals hierarchy and then also financial goals. Okay. All right. So we have our goals hierarchy diagram here. Uh, Toyota's done really well. They're able to pretty much position themselves in a favorable market. And you've seen it with the, the whole slides, all the slides. And we've been able to kind of show that, hey, that they're doing well. There's still something that they need to kind of go over that hump. And for long-term growth, uh, the main thing would be is to expand in China and possibly India to develop and also electronic vehicles, trying to get them through uh, possibly, and then also autonomous vehicles getting them there. Uh, yeah. 
uh, we can take this model and uh, I guess uh, uh, apply it a little bit. We have nothing to worry about with regard to uh, financial risk. There certainly is competitive risk. Uh, but we can call Toyota's level of risk acceptable. Its financial results are acceptable. Every company in this industry uh, is seeking a more favorable market position because nobody has dominant, overwhelming market share. Uh, however, because of this change in technology, some companies can seek long-term growth. And that's, that's where we, do you remember the jumping curves? The S curve shape over the curve. S shape? Yeah. yeah. Well, that's what's going on here. To play long-term growth in this industry, you have to jump curves, okay? And that's what Toyota's trying to do. Uh, and uh, General Motors is trying to do it, but General Motors has more financial baggage, right? Toyota's got less financial baggage. Uh, but to play this game and win, you got to get into this stuff you've been talking about. Self-driving, electrical, uh, something in between with sensors in the road, recharging stations. Who knows what this thing's going to look like 10 years from now. All we know is for sure it's going to be different. Okay. And we've got some ideas what that, what, what that, what those differences are. So, some companies can play long-term growth in this industry. Toyota is probably the best equipped to play long-term growth. Mm, Volkswagen, maybe. Uh, it's got a little extra baggage, but it's also got some great technology. You get the idea. The point that I wanna make here is that not everybody, even if they've got what looks like a favorable market position, can play long-term growth. It takes a, a, a unique combination of capabilities. And, uh, you know, Toyota has one of those because it doesn't have too much e extra baggage. And it's got some great technology to begin with, as well as a strong market position. So of all the companies out there that can play long-term growth, Toyota looks like the one that can do it. We'll see. Yeah. This kind of just uh, mirrors what we just talked about a little bit more. Uh, their the main the top of their goal would be long term growth, favorable market. They're already there, so it's just kind of an, another way of looking at it. Mm -hmm. uh, the financial goals are what we're going to be talking about next. Uh, the financial goals of Toyota are to increase revenue over time by increasing the sales in emerging markets. Uh, while also increasing the operating margin. Uh, the ROI will increase as Toyota continues to invest in research and development, and the ROE is expected to stay steady as it has over the past 10 years. Yeah, uh, it's uh, projected by value <clears throat> to drop and then work its way back up. Uh, I suspect that if you went to, to uh, Tokyo, and ask the executives at Toyota, they wouldn't think that that's very good goal setting. Uh, they, no. they, they would think that maybe, you know, the, the, they, they should not be a, a, expecting or wanting to see a decline like that, but rather to move up a little more immediately. Uh, what, what were you gonna say, Amanda? No, I, um, I completely agree. Um, I was just uh, kept tried to keep with the trends that they had had in the past. And then instead of spiking back up on that ROE, have just a steady gradual, um, but most definitely. Yeah, goals are standards for success, right? What we've got here is value lines projection. But it looks like as a team, we're agreeing right now that these are not standards for success. When we talk about a decline in rate of return on equity, that the uh, growth rate of shareholders' equity, shareholders aren't going to be too pleased by that. Shareholders would like to see some aspirations that are just a little more ambitious than this. Um, that was a good discussion. And that was an especially good remark by Amanda. 
uh, you know, she didn't hesitate at all. She she rejected this as a as a goal. And uh, uh, good for you. Good, good, good for you. Okay. Um, we anticipate the long-term debt increasing as uh, Toyota invests in the emerging markets of China and India. Um, we anticipate them having to um, spend some sub 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 substantial amount of money um, to get into these markets. Uh, Toyota will continue to have a low leverage ratio, so they are able to continue being strategically aggressive. Yeah, so we would not be disappointed or surprised if the leverage ratio did not dip uh, quite the way it's projected here, uh, but we'd be delighted to see that because uh, the leverage ratio is comfortable. What we want to see is a little bit of aggressiveness, like putting those mm -hmm. two wheelers into India though, that we saw on the, that were being tried out in, in Tokyo. We'd like to see those things get into Mumbai and maybe kick a little ass. Woo! <laughs> yeah. yeah. Okay. And then this is just a financial goal summary, uh, which includes the actual figures from 2019 and what we have projected in those previous slides uh, through uh, 2026. Uh, the last column is the uh, dollar figures and the percentage of change. Uh, as you can see from 2019 to 2026, the sales will increase 17% uh, overall from 2019 to 2026 with a gradual increase each year. Uh, the long-term debt uh, nearly doubles to try to get into those markets and um, our invested capital uh, increases quite a bit as well. Yeah, now again, do you guys like this for a statement of goals? I mean, here's return on invested capital. Uh, that's not, that's pretty good. That's going to move us up uh, to 14%. That's, that's better. Um, like to see return on equity going up just a little bit faster than 12%, but uh, you know, it's only a half a percent growth. So uh, I guess what I'm trying to portray is, is what the conversation looks like in the boardroom when they're sitting around looking at this summary that's brought in by the uh, corporate planning department. <laughs> you know, the conversation might, might be a little different than it, than it is in, in Value Line's boardroom. Uh, okay, we can borrow money, but really, are we going to double our debt? Is that right? That's that's a that's a pretty big commitment. If we can get a good return on it, okay. Uh, but you're you're telling me I'm going to get a 14 percent between you know 2019 and 2026, but uh, I'm only getting seven percent now. I'd, if I'm going to put that kind of capital in, I, I sure would like to see a, a good return on it. Okay. And part of that's only because we were going to 2026 and going five years out and the time it takes to build that type of infrastructure, we just mm -hmm. couldn't anticipate having much more return that quickly. Yeah. Okay. Uh, our leverage still stays nice and cool. Um, Fair enough. Sales don't go up that much though. 17% in seven years, is that right? Uh, yes, sir. I kept the sales uh, figure just a little bit higher than what they were doing. I think that their sales uh, from 2014 or 15 or to 2019 was increasing at about uh, one or two percent and I bumped it up a little bit more than half a percent, uh, just to try to keep uh, some realistic figures. Yeah. Well, this is just a casual conversation. There's nothing that reflects on your work or certainly your grade. Um, <clears throat> but, uh, uh, you know, we, we've been talking about putting those new cars into India. We've talking about a new class of electric cars and so forth. So uh, all of that gets me 17 percentage points and, and uh, uh, seven years, or or yeah, I guess seven years. Um, it's it it just makes you wonder. Gosh, is uh, on the other hand, you know that's that's uh, forty seven billion dollars. That's not exactly chopped liver. So uh, you got to put all this stuff in perspective, and that's what corporate planning is about: is putting it all in perspective. 
Okay. Uh, so the next section will cover strategy. We'll go over uh, strategic objectives, the China and Japan repair, uh, some joint ventures, ANSOFT's growth matrix, and then an unrelated diversification. Okay. So this is a little model for the strategic objectives. Give me a second. <clears throat> I'm sorry. <laughs> You're fine. I got all clumsied up there. Oh, so I'm going to go ahead and discuss this. So for competitive advantage, we have our differentiation and at least cost models. But for Toyota themselves, the hybrid model will be the most effective just because that's what they are and how they can do things. So you have the production side of things where it's Kai, Kaizen, Kaiban, Kanban, and how they can cut operating costs by being able to produce everything this way. Um, also, as far as doing that, the differentiation comes into play. You have research and development, uh, low fuel uh, consumptions. Yeah, that probably could have been the other way. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, low fuel consumption, that's the, this being on the top of oh, the industry. Better. Right? Yeah. I, as I'm saying that, I'm looking at it, I'm like, ah, okay. Oh, okay. But, uh, definitely, definitely. Thank you for doing that. Yep. Uh, no trouble. Uh, we have, so on that side, research development. A low at least cost, being able to produce things uh, effectively. The just in time uh, production is great because of inventory, being able to have it at, at a moment's notice. So. Yeah. And in fact, there's a diagram in your textbook that, that looks sort of like this competitive advantage flows from both low cost or better, least cost, and differentiation. And those two sources of competitive advantage flow from competences, such as at the top of this diagram. This is a great diagram now. <laughs> and I mean, we've uh, discussed this plenty of times, and it's yeah. just one of those major points we, we have to make. Yeah, I mean, it's okay. again, China, we need to be able to go in there. That's pretty much it. Yeah. And that's how we're going to do it. So the <laughs> joint venture between Toyota and BYD is a monumental move. Um, I read it in my research, and I also judge it, judged it by the reaction that I received from Professor Rona. <laughs> so I knew it was super important, you know. Um, but BYD is a Chinese manufacturer of automobiles, battery-powered bicycles, buses, forklifts, solar panels, and rechargeable batteries. It also has two major uh, subsidi subsidiaries, which is BYD Automobile and uh, BYD Electric. It is the world's largest electric vehicle company. Um, I believe that by Toyota doing this, it's entering in an already established market. Um, I think by now we've all seen that the next up and coming is gonna be electric vehicles. And with China producing most of the CO2 emissions for the world, um, the government has made it a point to control that and bring it down. Um, so what they did was they spent nearly $60 billion in the last decade to create an industry that builds electric car cars while also reducing the number of licenses available for gasoline-powered cars. Um, just to give you an example, in 2018, more electric cars were sold in China than the rest of the world uh, combined. Yeah. So that's how big this market is, and Toyota is stepping right in there with BYD. Um, this company is also responsible for building the batteries in our cell phones back in the 90s. I don't know if you guys remember the brick cell phones. Um, they were the, the company that provided the batteries for those phones. And they are, they are also the number one provider of plug-in vehicles globally as well. Um, this is also important because batteries are made up of four components, which is the anode, the cathode, separator, and electrolyte. And China currently controls between 50 and 77% of the global market for the raw materials of these components. So if that's where globally we're going, China is going to have... Uh, a lot to do with that as far as raw materials. So with Toyota stepping in and establishing that relationship, um, they're going for the, the ride as well. Yeah. Now, in this industry segment, 
there's a new hound in the hunt. Tesla. Yes. And as you pointed out, Tesla has this monster plant in Shanghai that's producing electric vehicles. So Toyota, it's, it's, it's a Toyota versus Tesla thing. Uh, and we'll have to watch that. That's a, that's a new game. Mm -hmm. And we'll just have to see how that game plays out. Okay. This next uh, graph is just a, a visual of the largest producers for fossil fuels. Yeah. And you see China has double um, the United States. So that's why they have, they're committed to lowering that number uh, as, as low as possible. Yeah. Yep. This next joint venture is with um, Toyota and Mazda. Previously, when we were discussing the markets, I mentioned that in the U.S. market, they were declining in sales due to um, a consumer shift. And the consumer shift was more towards smaller SUVs and trucks. And so this is where I believe Toyota is um, satisfying that, that urge. Um, her, Toyota and Mazda are now collaborating to manufacture about 300,000 vehicles annually. They haven't released a picture of the SUV, but it's expected to drop in 2021. Okay. Um, next, we're going to go through Ansoft's uh, growth matrix. Uh, Ansoft's growth matrix shows uh, where Toyota has been and where they are going. Uh, the market penetration is the safest of the four options where focus is on the current products. Uh, the product development is slightly more risky as Toyota is putting a new product into an existing market. Our market development is existing products in a new market, which is Toyota offering its current lineup in India or in China. And product diversification is the most of the risky, uh, and that would be Toyota offering a new product in a new environment, which could include their electric vehicles, fuel cells, hybrids, and the joint ventures for rideshare robots. Uh, additionally, we've got the Joby Air Taxi Service listed here, uh, which we'll learn a little bit uh, about a little bit later. Okay. And here it is. So Toyota and Joby Aviation have partnered up. Um, Joby Aviation, this here is an example of unrelated diversification where Toyota is stepping out of the norm and trying to explore new markets. And this is where Joby Aviation comes into play. Um, it's a source of a flying taxi. And Toyota sees it as a long-term vision. Um, hopefully with time, this this um, form of transportation will pick up and gain popularity uh, for short aerial flights. And so the relationship gives Joby Aviation access to Toyota's considerable manufacturing experience uh, when pr production begins. Mm -hmm. So the next section is the implementation priorities. We're gonna go over emerging market strategy, vertical integration, horizontal integration, and then electric vehicles. So one of our um, strategic ideas for entering India would be that we uh, are in a joint venture or with an existing automotive manufacturer from India, and uh, Toyota will be working on developing an electric version of uh, the most common two-wheeled and three-wheeled vehicle. Okay, uh, so they'd be like golf carts. Right. And then um, the second would be uh, coordinating with the government to improve infrastructure um, in the country. And then uh, specifically investing in improving the road conditions. And obviously with that, the primary objective would be to improve the roadway so that Toyota uh, could have the ve their vehicles become more common. But an added benefit to that is that the locals would be the one responsible for constructing the roads. And so that influx and income could lead to those individuals being able to avoid uh, Toyota vehicles. Oh, that's a good point. Um, 
maybe we could even put sensors in the road and start looking toward autonomous vehicles. Um, does Toyota have any joint ventures with the major uh, Indian automotive companies like Suzuki or let's see, it wouldn't have with Mahindra. Uh, uh, I, I don't think they, yeah, I'm not sure. I can't remember. I don't think that they did. Yeah, um, it's rather interesting. Uh, I know that Ford uh, has, has one, I guess, with uh, uh, Tata, but uh, in any event, that just, uh, it, it surprises me that we don't see Toyota more involved with a joint venture partner in India. Um, I, 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 I can't be certain about this. I, sh I should know, but I can't be certain whether Toyota does or not. Okay. Um, so another idea that we had for Toyota um, as far as entering into India is in addition to improving the roadways, uh, Toyota should build electric charging stations for um, normal Toyota vehicles as well as two and three wheeled vehicles. Good idea. <clears throat> So our uh, strategic ideas for entering China, the first would be to propose electing a Chi Chinese member to the board of, to uh, the board of Toyota. Uh, this can be done just as a way of seeking to repair that cultural divide that was created during World War II. And then our um, second idea was partnering with the Chinese, Chinese government by offering to provide vehicles for branches of government. Um, so those would include the police services, social services, the higher ups and uh, you know, government officials. Um, so that would um, be in exchange for Toyota receiving access to the Chinese uh, market uh, as far as like permission to build there as well as advertisement through the use of those vehicles. I can see the politics of that one. <laughs> Brutal. You never know. Okay. Uh, so here we're going to talk about uh, joint venture and acquisition with suppliers, uh, specifically the vertical integration with Denso and Panasonic. Denso is based out of Japan. Uh, they produce in-vehicle semiconductors by uh, vert vertically integrating through, excuse me, Sorry, Denso uh, produces in-vehicle semiconductors. So Denso and Toyota have agreed to establish this joint venture for research and advanced development for the next emerging market, which is the electric vehicle. Um, this will be, I feel like this is kind of another coin in Toyota's pocket as we advance to that market. Um, let's see, we can go to the next slide. Okay. For this one, Panasonic is based out of Japan as well, and it's also a manufacturer of electric vehicle batteries. And this is another opportunity for vertical integration for Toyota. Um, again, I feel like this is just another way Toyota is kind of getting, getting ahead of the game, getting a piece of all these companies that are producing batteries for electric vehicles so they can get a, a pretty good market share. Okay. So next we'll talk about um, horizontal integration with uh, Denny and the one that starts with a P that I'm not sure how to pronounce. Pony-I. 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 <laughs> this is a joint venture with a company out of China. It is involved. Can you hear me? Um, it, we're, it's breaking up a little bit. Go ahead. No, nope, okay. now, now you're muted. You've muted your, your microphone, uh, Lisa. That's the other Lisa. Oh, we can hear you. Okay. It's just breaking okay. up a little, but I think you're back. Yeah. Okay. Um, so this joint venture involves uh, GAC Group, which is one of China's largest automakers. And they're, they've partnered up to create uh, vehicle-related services to drivers on the DD's ride-sharing platform. They're going to be working together. Um, they're going to use technology, which is developed by Toyota, for DD's mobility and vehicle sharing platform. Okay. Toyota and Pony AI. Um, this Pony AI is the autonomous taxi service 
uh, also known as Robot Taxis, based out of China. And the two companies are going to create a pilot program to test self-driving cars on public roads in two Chinese cities, which is Beijing and Shanghai. They're going to be co-developing mobility products like, mob like mobility services. And the, um, the taxis will be equipped with Toyota sh chauffeur software, which is focused on full autonomy. Yeah. Uh, and so this is, you know, if we think about developing drugs, you hear about this with the coronavirus and how we're going to develop a, uh, a new a drug to deal with the coronavirus. First, we come up with the molecule, right? The concept, the technology. Then we do a prototype and we try it out on uh, mice, you know? Then we try uh, a limited application to people to test safety and effectiveness just sort of very carefully. And then if all that goes well, we go into stage two and three and, and get it into the marketplace. Here we are uh, with something that looks sort of like uh, uh, maybe the, the stage two uh, drug, right? We, uh, Toyota's got apparently an autonomous vehicle. Uh, now they need a chance to try it out to do the research, the experiment, and uh, prove the concept, and improve the concept. So you can bet that in these pony cars, there will be a human being, right? <laughs> but uh, otherwise, they'd scare the hell out of their, their passenger. Uh, but, uh, uh, you know, what's, why is Toyota doing this with Pony? Pony thinks it's great because they're going to get these great cars, okay? And Toyota thinks it's great because they're going to be able to do this, this thing that's akin to giving the first prototype drugs to a few human beings to just try this thing out and see what works and what doesn't and how it works. Uh, this is a brilliant idea by uh, Toyota. I don't know about Pony, but Toyota sure got what it wanted. <laughs> so the last section is on the organizational structure changes. Okay. So this is what we will, um, like again, a snapshot of what the organizational structure does look like. Um, I did look into as far as the, the board and I did not see any uh, Chinese um, nationals in the board. A lot of them were still from Japan. There were some, um, looks like North American presence and stuff, but definitely that's a, one way to do it. But they do have an operations group in China. And that's the first circled um, section. Uh, our proposal is probably changing, adding something for India operations group, just because that's newly developed. There's not much known about where to go. So they definitely need to have a separate group for that. So that's adding into one of the regions. Um, or like taking them out of the regions, have like a separate region for them. Um, and then also with research and development, um, not just in China and India, but just in, as a whole, uh, this new electronic um, vehicles, autonomous, that's a whole can of worms that we're going into and it's still kind of new, but uh, there's definitely gonna be new, uh, those minds working on it are definitely gonna have to be working together and probably not um, someone that's traditional to the whole combustion engine kind of mode of transportation. Are these rectangles in red your suggestions or yes. are they brand new operations you, that exist? No, I put those in there. Ah, very good. I agree yeah. with you. Those are good recommendations. And I think, is that the last? Yeah. Yeah. Best slide right here. This is our this oh, is the favorite slide. My friend. Yes. So Thank you. thank you for all your help during this course and this presentation and of course Mr. Waffles moral support. Yeah. <laughs> Mr. Waffles, I've, Mr. I've, Waffles. I've, I've shown this to my wife and uh, and to Mr. Waffles uh, and they, they both asked me to thank you uh, for putting Mr. Waffles into, into the presentation. Uh, yeah, we were glad since, to do it. Since this makes him a uh, uh, a media
personality now. This goes out onto uh, YouTube, and so uh, the public at large will now have a chance uh, to see uh, our mascot, Mr. Waffles. Yes. I think this is uh, this is uh, just just exactly the perfect stuff. Uh, oh, oh, let me stop the recording. <laughs> That's what I should do because it takes up so much space. Um, it, let me, but before I do, let me record that uh, you guys have done a, a really, really good job. Thank you. Uh, Thank you. And, uh, you know, with some teams, I want to say that to make them feel good. Uh, in <laughs> this case, I'm saying it because it's true. You've done a really good job. You've covered everything. Uh, your answers were right. Uh, uh, the concepts were correct, and the scope was overwhelmingly comprehensive. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. I'm going to I'm going to stop.